Good morning to you all. Uh, this is uh, Raman from ARC Odyssey Group India. Uh, welcome to the DTC Asia event. The DTC Asia event will be for about uh, 60 minutes. You can see the speaker, Greg Gorbach, on the screen. I also have my colleague, uh, he's uh, Greg Gorbach, he's speaking from USA. So it's uh, very early morning, he agreed to be part of this speaking session. We thank him for that first. Then we also have Bob Will, he's based out of Singapore, the general manager from uh, ARC. I have my colleagues Rajkumar and uh, Saurabh from ARC Bangalore. So we are based out of Bangalore. So we have three people based out of Bangalore and uh, one from US and one from uh, Singapore. So primarily the DTC is a place for the people to connect, collaborate, learn, and share with peers who are digitizing and transforming their organization. But uh, as, as you know, the DTC is an end user community. We do, we get a lot of requests from suppliers to participate in the DTC. We regret them. We are sorry about that. But we welcome all the end users to share this experience uh, without any inhibitions. And the, being part of DTC provides an opportunity to interact with the IRC analyst also. So details of the webinar, uh, this will be for about, as I mentioned, it will be for about 60 minutes. The guest speaker, this time is from ARC Advisory Group, is Greg Gorbert, Vice President, Digitization and IOT. After the guest speaker speaks for about, uh, on the team for about uh, 25 to 30 minutes, we'll have a panel discussion with Bob Gill and Greg, uh, maybe around 15 minutes or so. Then we'll open it for audience Q&A. Uh, we are quite conscious of the time. We'll close it exactly at about 60 minutes once the session starts. Uh, request all the delegates as you keep listening to Greg's presentation. Please put your questions in Q&A and chat box. We won't take the questions live. So please put it in the chat box. Over to you, Greg. Greg, please take over. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Raman. Let me... Um... See if we can get this working here properly. Okay. Um, one moment. There, that should do it. Okay. Oh, uh, so thanks everyone. And uh, I'm pleased to be here today. I'm Greg Gorbach. Um, I head up the digital transformation team here at ARC. And I'm also, um, uh, you know, one of the uh, board members for the Digital Transformation Council that we started uh, here about five or six years ago, I think it was. Um, so today we're going to talk about digital transformation in the age of AI and sustainability. Before we get, uh, get into that, let me just offer a few extra words about the Digital Transformation Council. When we started it, we had this mission of um, enabling industry, energy, and public sector professionals to keep abreast of the many emerging technologies and business trends, to learn from others on similar journeys, and to leverage these trends and technologies to achieve transformational growth. And we've been, um, we've had quite a bit of success, I would say, in, in following that mission throughout the years. Um, you know, we Look, currently we're looking at things like digital transformation and sustainability and energy transition and artificial intelligence. Those are certainly the topics of my talk today. Uh, and, uh, you know, we look across one of the benefits is having members from many industries uh, participate because uh, it's a good idea. It's a good way to learn from others uh, who are doing things in a little bit different way or different place, uh, but we can still learn. Um, and we also found that this kind of knowledge exchange, this kind of learning requires participation. So uh, later in the later in the meeting today, we'll try to uh, uh, hear from you. We'd love to hear your participation as well. So with that, uh, let me get into today's topics. I'm going to be talking about three trends that all kind of reinforce each other. I'm going to be talking about AI. Uh, sustainability and energy transition and digital trans transformation, uh, especially the building blocks of digital transformation that I call them. 
and then how to make some progress on your digital transformation initiatives. So that's that's our agenda for today. We did um, a survey a few months ago here at ARC, a survey of manufacturers, and looked at what are some of the top industrial investment drivers for this year, 2023, and uh, growth, cost reduction, operating performance, sustainability, and innovative new products and services are the leading reasons that manufacturers are investing in plant technology in 2023. But you can see there are a host of other ones that we also um, got some, some good feedback on. So let me uh, jump to the first topic, uh, industrial AI. Well, what is this industrial AI? Uh, you know, uh, chat GPT and uh, large language models have certainly sparked an interest in AI recently, but it's honestly, it's been a growing phenomenon for years. We're only seeing the tip of the iceberg um, as this was, you know, going to continue to grow and develop. We, we um, here we've got a few different uh, aspects of, of AI. Uh, I'm only scratching the surface, I think, here. But what we do know is that uh, it's useful to think about the impact AI will have on the organization, on the enterprise. And it's gonna have some impact through its business processes, through its systems and technology, and through, and uh, of course, with people as well. So today I'm pre previewing some content from a, um, uh, either soon to be released or maybe just recently released report, ARC report authored by my colleague, Colin Masson, uh, with help from our core AI team here at ARC. And in the report, Colin makes an interesting point. He says industrial organizations must not only adopt AI, but also govern its integration into their existing delicate balance of people, business processes, and technology systems infrastructure. And I think that captures a, you know, it's an easy one sentence uh, uh, statement, but it captures a lot of, uh, of what uh, industrial companies are struggling with today. Now, it's also true that, um, you know, in addition to those AI things, um, you know, you can use a chart like this to depict the impact of AI on other software throughout the enterprise. So it's a, a very busy chart, and we won't try to explain it all in a, here due to limited time. But it only captures a hint of um, uh, of the um, expected impact of AI throughout the enterprise. My mouse is jumping around here a little bit. Sorry. We also use this framework to help clients um, think through their AI initiatives and ensure they're not missing a critical piece. For example, um, you know, in this uh, intersection here, we can talk about uh, industrial AI use cases and which use cases the clients might be uh, should be pursuing. And maybe part of that is automating some of the work, and AI can play an important role in that. But to do that. Uh, you may need some uh, uh, productivity tools enhanced with AI, for example. And um, to get those to work, you need some foundation models and toolkits, as well as an industrial data fabric uh, to make it all come together. So um, as you can see, um, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot going on on this slide as well. Um, the next you know, we in a similar way, we can think about the workforce requirements and impacts on people throughout the enterprise. And this just gives us a sample of where those various roles interact with this model. So we could do that. As we think about AI use growing throughout the organization, it seems clear that AI will have a disproportionate impact on business processes and on systems for sure, but it'll also impact people. 
but um, we well we know there's going to be an impact. We can only guess exactly how big these things will be, but uh, that's part of the fun. So let's take a deeper dive on um, on some of the, the industrial AI use cases. Let's start with supply chain. In the supply chain arena. We see AI uh, being used for demand forecasting and inventory optimization, supply chain design and risk management, logistics optimization, and supplier selection. Other things as well, but these are the top ones that we've been able to identify. In product development and design, um, you know, uh, AI uh, is, is underlies generative design. It's contributing to materials uh, science and material selections for, for products and systems. Uh, it plays a key role in simulation and testing, sustainability analysis, and cost optimization. On the production side, uh, we, you know, AI contributes uh, to production scheduling, quality control, predictive maintenance, uh, process optimization and waste reduction, and uh, of course, it's an underlying technology for digital twins and metaverse. Um, skills gap, uh, workforce um, and uh, management, AI is playing a role in uh, skills gap analysis and recruitment and employee retention, uh, collaboration tools and productivity analysis. And then in the sales and service arena, we're seeing AI um, underlying uh, or driving customer segmentation, sales forecasting, uh, smarter chatbots, product recommendations, and sentiment analysis, among other things. So that's the uh, that's the environment that we see. Let me look at one example. Um, we witnessed an evolution in the asset management space in recent times, driven by two things. Um, First, um, IoT and connected assets, which provide machine health and, and process data. And then um, analytics and AI to take that data and, and make recommendations and decisions and decision support and do some useful things with it and drive performance to the next level. So we've seen that developing and often one of the first places that companies start is with predictive maintenance uh, using based on some AI and anomaly detection and such. Let me shift gears here a little bit now and talk about sustainability. So I'll start with uh, a few decarbonization and energy transition facts. First. We all know that emissions have to be lowered, and uh, we most of us understand that scope three emissions are the most difficult ones um, to deal with, but they are a significant part of the of the emissions that companies are dealing with. Um, it's a global problem, and global action is, is needed. It's not going to be cheap. Uh, there's some significant costs to be uh, to be dealt with. Um, Part of the solution is going to be electrification, which is underway in a big way right now and expected to grow strongly. And another big factor is energy uh, innovation. And we're seeing uh, annual investments in energy supply and production uh, growing rapidly. But um, so the need for sustainability, a lot of times companies think about reporting first, reporting requirements, but really um, the, the need for sustainability drives programs that drive automation, AI, and software investment. For example, if the notion is we're gonna become more sustainable, then that may manifest itself as low carbon and renewable investments. Uh, more worker and process safety, greenhouse gas reduction, resilience and security, and circular economy. And then within that area, um, you know, you may see um, uh, wind and solar projects undertaken, or emission reductions and flare reductions and energy intensity, or recycling processes and uh, water use and mindful decommissioning and things of that nature. So. 
the message, one of the key messages that we have is that sustainability requires digital transformation. And oftentimes digital transformation requires AI. So it all ties together. Here's how this is manifesting itself in some critical industries. Um, let's just look at the energy, oil, and gas, and chemicals. In all the, both of these areas, we have consumer pressures and government regulations and investors all pressurizing the industry. And the industry is responding by, in the case of energy, oil, and gas, it's uh, dealing with programs that uh, in some way or other uh, are, are meant to support energy and transition. So it's affordable clean energy and land and water management and becoming a low carbon business and reducing carbon intensity in products, for example. Um, in the chemicals uh, industry, it can show up as creating sustainable products in a circular economy with less waste and reduce use of water and paying attention to the planet and reducing CO2 emissions. So these are the kinds of, um, the kinds of things that we're already seeing happening. But there are some challenges. This doesn't come um, you know, easily necessarily. And some of those challenges are uh, finding the right supporting technologies and measuring tr and tracking performance. Uh, deriving business value from a sustainability program, um, a lack of clear definition for what qualifies as an ESG or, or sustainability strategy, and lack of correct in-house uh, skills and expertise and others as well. I won't go through them all, but the key point is that that motivation to change doesn't equal the ability to change. So, um, you know, there are a lot of challenges there. And to help illustrate that a little bit more, uh, we have this kind of a notion of an ESG framework with uh, scope one, two, and three emissions. Um, companies have to create a strategy that's transparent and actionable and quantifiable, taking into account um, the resources uh, footprint with energy, water, and materials as well as the value chain uh, realities across the ecosystem and within your own organization and uh, out to the consumers. And all this needs to be um, um, take, uh, also taken into account some significant business decisions with regard to cost and competition and stakeholders needs and resiliency requirements and products and product features related to sustainability, company profitability, what's it mean for engineering, what's it mean for production ops. So there are a few clear lines. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of things that need to be done and no, typically no one organization responsible for making it all happen because it happens and it must happen across the entire company. So it can be challenging. Still, um, you know, when in our survey, we ask about, well, are these things good for business? And the vast majority of, of the respondents say, yeah, we do expect that there are going to be positive business outcomes from all these new sustainability activities. And the other good news is that um, um, more than half of manufacturers in our survey uh, have already established sustainability targets, goals, or KPIs. About a third have a strategy in place, and only a you know ten percent or less uh, don't have a program yet. So there's good progress being made in that arena. So now let me jump uh, to the digital transformation portion of today's program. You know, sometime in the uh, 1980s, we started to see a widespread adoption of software applications uh, in industry. And then over time, we saw many of those applications migrate to a software as a service model. And, you know, there, there's still examples of all of these in, in uh, around the world that you can find, but generally the industry is moving in this direction. <clears throat> Today, we're witnessing another big change, and that is moving 
to composable apps. You know, and as the industry begins uh, to realize that this approach uh, is going to be well suited to the host uh, an explosion of other technologies that they need to deal with. We expect this trend to composable apps will only continue. So that's why I call this the industrial big bang. So on this chart, we're kind of entering into this world on the right-hand side with composable apps and a host of, uh, of emerging and disrupting technologies that companies have to deal with which makes it um, interesting and challenging. When we talk about digital transformation here at ARC, we talk about the integration of digital technology into all areas of business, but, all, but importantly, uh, the goal is not just to have technology, but to change the way companies operate and to deliver value to customers. So, the organization is typically charged to use those technologies to innovate and improve across multiple dimensions like um, culture and leadership and operational agility and workforce engagement and customer experience and so forth. And why are companies doing this? Well, um, really today you need to have a, uh, you need to be moving in this direction of a digital company in order to respond to today's challenges because, you know, sustainability and rapidly changing customer requirements and demands. And, um, you know, you may be noticing high performing competitors, uh, either just emerging on the scene or uh, getting better at competing with you because they're digital digitalizing uh, and are a few steps ahead of you. Uh, the pandemic has shown us that there's a need for increased operating resilience uh, and supply chain volatility has um, only increased. Cost control, complexity, workforce issues, cybersecurity challenges and operating efficiency, all of these things um, you know, can benefit from digital transformation programs. And when we talk about technologies that'll change manufacturing, we ask our, um, our community about, um, about what they think most impactful technologies will be. And artificial intelligence rose right to the top of that list, uh, not far behind is cloud. And then some things like battery and power and business analytics and big data, um, cellular networks, internet of things and, and so forth. Uh, but in the next uh, in the next five years, by 2028, we expect to see some big things happening here. So um, so then let me just move to the next slide where we can talk about um, what I call the uh, digital transformation technology building blocks. Um, so I try to use this to say that things have changed in, in this arena. So let's just go through and I'll uh, try to build this out a bit. So at the first level, there are um, there's machines and assets and control systems. And increasingly, these are cyber physical systems or um, smart, instrumented and connected uh, plant and IoT systems. Um, those systems generate a uh, host an increasingly huge amount of production data related to process and product and EHS and sustainability and machine health data and more. Um, on top of all that, we have um, the engineering and plant software arena. This is an arena that has been populated by standalone apps. Uh, um, in, in many cases up till now, but uh, those are being reworked in many cases to be software as a service and then uh, composable. So we're seeing that happening in all of the familiar apps that we that we know and love. Those things have to run somewhere, and uh, that means that the OT guys need to get familiar with running compute storage and network systems. 
uh, and managing where their data goes. So it's cloud and data center and edge uh, distribution of your computing system. So that's just another complication. Um, in addition, uh, and in some cases we see you know, some of our clients really have um, a staff just devoted to you know, some of these different areas. So maybe you need a staff or, or at least a program or uh, an initiative to, to target data models and analytics, which includes, you know, data ops and data management and analytics, but also AI and reasoning systems and knowledge management and digital models um, and digital twins and so forth. The enterprise software that used to be um, you know, at the top of the pyramid and it was nice to be interoperable by which we usually meant we'd share a little bit of data in both directions. Um, as these you know, AI programs and other programs are, are kind of shrinking these, the world and, and taking a bigger look at the, the business processes and how they work through the organization, uh, things like the governance or reporting and planning and procurement and supply chain issues all become um, closer and more important uh, to effectively running the plants. The, this bit is about orchestration, and here we see this involves the workforce a lot, but there's um, you know, a need for effective communications and collaboration systems within the plant and orchestration and activity management systems, mobile and augmented reality systems, and then composable apps. And last but not least, uh, I put it down here as a kind of a footnote, but uh, but cybersecurity is critically important. And uh, just, I don't have a good way to show it, but it, it really goes through this entire, uh, this entire stack here. So cybersecurity must be taken into account as well. So those are the overall um, building blocks uh, that we want to talk about. Um, so where are we? Uh, most manufacturers have made progress along their digital transformation journey, but only about a third report that they're well underway or already focused on optimization and business results. 15% uh, haven't started yet. They'll get there. And uh, the other good news is that we have seen that digital transformation, those who are down the road on that have been able to see some uh, measurable results in the area of improved quality and productivity and safety, reduced cost um, with faster innovation and improved customer outcomes. So these are some of the many measurable improvements uh, that, that um, industrial companies are seeing from digital transformation. Let me um, just wrap up here by talking a little bit about um, what companies need to do and what they need to think about in order to keep moving the digital transformation initiatives forward. So the first thing uh, that we recommend is, the, is that you develop four skills and those skills include imagine and reimagining the future state. You can't really get there if you can't somehow envision it. You need to be um, adept at mastering new technologies and deploying them effectively. Uh, as a leader, you should empower the organization's collective intelligence, and certainly AI can play a big role there. And as, again, um, there are going to be setbacks, um, so you need to be able to lead the organization despite those inevitable setbacks and obstacles. So you need to overcome them as well. Um, innovation, um, it's important to continue to emphasize innovation and transformation as a strategic measure. And by that, I mean, it's easy to fall into the trap of, oh, this is a cool technology that my boss asked me to investigate or um, I think I can improve performance, um, you know, of this worker by, you know, a few percent if I have a, a different technology. Those are good, uh, but better is a, is a strategic plan. Um, 
And in doing these programs, uh, you always keep in mind the organization's overarching goals. Where are they trying to go? What are their big uh, hot buttons for this year? Uh, that helps select and prioritize the transformation targets. You know, there's, uh, there's different parts of the organization that are working on products and services and production operations and design and engineering and supply chain and business operations, and they're all competing. There is room for digital transformation in each one of them, and every one of them is competing for this. So it's, it helps to have a holistic view so you can select and, pr and prioritize those targets. We talked about the technology building blocks. The point of that is not to just have another list of technologies, but to, these are the key areas that need to be properly resourced in order to for your digital transformation strategy to succeed. Um, another important thing is to have change agents in the organizations in your organization and empower them. Uh, it's critically important, we think, to secure external insight, validation, and education. You know, you don't know everything. Um, your colleagues don't know. Um, other companies may may know something. This is one of the actually this is one of the values of uh, and one of the reasons behind the Digital Transformation Council because here's a place where we can share. Uh, confidently share um, insights and, pro and projects and what we've done and what's worked and often even more importantly what hasn't worked uh, so we find that's that's very well so ARC can help with that uh, the, the digital innovation strategy should be formalized and goal-oriented and be sure to incorporate the workforce dimension uh, you need to uh, foster a culture of change and uh, adaptively execute. It's going to be complex, so uh, you need to prepare for that and, and act accordingly. And then finally, I like to say that you have to do all this uh, anticipating the 21st century industrial ecosystem. So this 21st century uh, operational in ecosystem is depicted here. It shows, uh, you know, production operations primarily here uh, with links to the outside world all around the top. Um, in the past, uh, and in some cases still today, but it's changing, these production operations were populated with what I've called internal actors, you know, employees of the company uh, playing their different roles. Now, today we're seeing... Um, uh, in many cases, external actors of various kinds. So we may have the asset managers showing up in the plant or machine monitoring service or service technicians, you know, or third-party service suppliers or part suppliers or other specialized services suppliers, even the customers in some cases showing up in the plant. And um, uh, it even extends outside the plant. So, you know, you may call in a remote expert uh, to help you via um, Zoom or augmented reality or some other technology, or um, or you may let uh, you may have some workers who are remote workers at least part of the time. Uh, we certainly saw a lot of that in the pandemic, and there's still some going on. And another characteristic of this 21st century operational ecosystem is um, that we're move, you know, it, it it's important to think about moving from the traditional metric of achieving operational excellence to the 21st century metric of achieving competitive excellence. So it's a little bit different focus and it looks a little bit outside the plant. And it uh, is a nod to the notion that all these business processes are interconnected. And with that, um, I hope I haven't gone too far over on my time. But uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. I, um, I'm open for our next stage here. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg, for that for that presentation. And right now, we're going to extend and ampl amplify some of the things that, uh, that you mentioned just now. And after that, we'll go into audience Q&A. So as we're going through, um, this, uh, please think about questions you may want to ask Greg and pack this into the Q&A box if, if you can. 
Um, but Greg, yeah, I thought it was interesting. Uh, I think towards the end, you put up one slide, I think it's called referencing digital transformation. Where are we? Uh, and I know that you at ARC and your team in particular has been following and analyzing digital transformation for s several years now. So, so in that in that in that tile, what changes have you observed in terms of end user awareness, adoption, and also success? I mean, where where have we gone in terms of those those aspects? Okay. Um... Yeah, we've we have been following it, and in fact, uh, one of the things that um, you, you know about maybe six months or a year ago, I um, put together a report and and started talking about the digital transformation midlife crisis because we noticed that um, companies had made a lot of progress, and then uh, you know they weren't sure that we should be talking about it. They, you know, you know, you see some things like well. Is digital transformation really the right word for the for what we're doing? Uh, you know, there was some some questions like that. But um, mm. so we did see a little bit of a of a kind of a rethinking going on. But I would say that's uh, um, there's nothing much behind it. You know, it's good to ask those questions and to check those things out, but. The fact of the matter is that every company that we talk to is pursuing digital transformation today. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, it's partly, maybe in no small part, because sustainability uh, requires digital transformation. And that's been a hot topic. And now AI, which is part of digital transformation, is also a hot topic. So it's um, every company is doing it. And those are, you know, some of the other topics are just woven into the fabric of it, you might say. So we don't really see companies pushing back on the concept. I mean, it's we always talk about where no. to start, how to roll out and scale, what to prioritize. Those are the those are the kind of things we're hearing about digital transformation these days. Okay. So you think we can get over the the midlife crisis then? Uh, oh yeah, I, I'm confident. I think we're we're yeah. uh, <laughs> we're well past uh, it. Okay. I mean, I honestly yeah. the name the name could change, um, but the but the mm. work but the work continues. You know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, at the beginning of your, of your presentation, you, you you mentioned the Digital Transformation Council. You know, this was set up in the US first in 2018, and we, we brought the initiative over to, to Asia uh, in at the end of 2020. Uh, so, and uh, we, we've had a lot of end user stories uh, over the last uh, couple of years, and I'm sure you have too, uh, where you are. Um, so, from what you've been hearing from those, those companies, those, those manufacturers uh, in the main, did you did you find some consistent themes coming across to you um, in terms of the issues that people are facing, uh, you know, problem scaling initiatives or the, oh. the difficulties in managing people and managing change? Did did, did you did some of those come oh. across to you? <laughs> well, yeah, those are those are excellent examples, actually. Bob. All right, okay. Uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, we've certainly seen those those. Um, uh, those themes uh, crop up over and over again. And of course, more recently, we've been hearing a lot about sustainability and AI. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, mm. Other things that we are hearing um, are, um, uh, you know, questions about, well, what are other companies doing about digital transformation? How, you know, how do I compare mm. to them? We hear a lot of that. Uh, sort of about their transformation programs, about specific technologies, um, mm. often about, um, I mean, sometimes we we hear the questions about technologies and we, but we really try to push a little bit towards how did you approach it? What were the problems you were trying to solve and how do you think about it? Because that's, you know, every company is a little different, but if you can understand mm. the thinking behind some change, um, mm -hmm. That can make a big difference in, um, a, you know, and, and the insight can, you know, can turn into an idea that you can pursue in your own company. Mm -hmm. But okay. I would say, Bob, the the biggest, probably a most consistent theme over the past year uh, has been about mm -hmm. data. About uh, data, okay. 
how do we get it, uh, where we keep it, how to manage it, uh, how do we secure it. Um, you know, that's that definitely uh, on the minds of a lot of companies. And it makes sense to me because, you know, it's kind of a foundational piece of if you're going to be deploying a, a software uh, throughout your organization and uh, AI, you're going to need some. Uh, you're going to need the data to support all that. So it's a it's an understandable first step, and we're mm. we've been dealing with that mm. quite a bit. So I'd say that's probably mm. the biggest theme that we've been been hit, hitting over. The I, last I, and I know you. I'm sorry. And I know Greg that you've. Uh had speakers uh, at events in the US from a variety of different industries. And I know you've engaged with clients from, from different industries as well. So do you find that some sector, and this also relates to, I see one of the questions that came in from one of our audience members. Do you, do you perceive that some sectors are more advanced than others on this, on this road oh, to transformation? You know, this, uh, I get this question a lot and, yeah. um, I, of course, each industry has its own drivers so, and, and own issues. So it's kind of hard to say that one sector is more advanced than another. But, um, you know, for example, um, company industries like automotive and heavy industry, heavy machinery, uh, you know, they're tackling significant changes uh, not only in their production systems and supply chain systems, uh, but also in their products and engineering those products. So um, it's, it's um, in some ways more complex. And uh, so they, and the issues related to that, uh, they're farther ahead probably. Process uh, industries don't have to deal with that, but not to say they don't have their own challenges that they're dealing with as well. So um, it's hard to say who's, who's ahead or which sector is more advanced. It kind of depends on the specifics of what you're looking for. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. And uh, I noticed also you in, in, in the in the slide on sustainability challenges that the respondents ranked finding the right supporting technologies as 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 the highest. I mean, does this does this indicate that end users are perhaps confused about all the different technologies that are available for improving sustainability, or is it the fact that the, the technologies themselves are not yet adequate for purpose? Um, well, there's a lot of confusion. Um, yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the technologies may not be quite adequate yet. Um, uh, when it comes to sustainability, right? But um, um, but I, I think that really there's there are, um, there are some other there are some other issues here, some other reasons for that confusion. I don't think it's only that the technologies are not quite adequate mm. yet, though they may be. But um, I think part of the problem is that in the sustainability world, um, there are so many different things to tackle. Uh, and there's mm -hmm. no one solution that you can point to for all of that. So different, you know, different companies are going to tackle different things mm -hmm. first and, and, you know, they're going to need a, a particular set of uh, software capabilities in order to manage that. So right. okay. that's part mm -hmm. of the issue. Sure. Um, you know, having said that, we're seeing all the usual suspects, you know, there are uh, suppliers and vendors out there mm -hmm. and they're working hard. Uh, yeah, host of, said, yeah. of different solutions on this. Yeah, okay. And then uh, uh, finally, yeah. um, you know, I talked about a little bit um, about uh, composable apps in my presentation, mm. uh, you know, with platforms and microservices. Yeah. I think that's going to go a long way towards solving this problem because um, if companies find that uh, suppliers haven't provided a proper solution, the you know the end users will be able to create it themselves mm. uh, if they've got that uh, that environment up and running. So I think okay. we're I think we're moving. That's okay. part of my big bang theory, I guess you could say. But mm. I I do believe that uh, that's going to help quite a bit. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, correct. Uh, looking at some of the audience questions that are, that I see coming in, um, the first one, and this is something that we have. Um, we kind of get get quite a, quite a, quite a few times, uh, and this relates to um, 
um, smaller organizations. Did you have any survey data on acceptance of digital transformation for small and medium um, based, small and medium uh, companies compared to the larger organizations? Because often SMEs, as this person says, the SMEs are often reluctant because uh, to, to engage in, in digital transformation because of the perceived high initial investment costs. So um, smaller yeah. companies, where, 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 are they, where are they in all this? Yeah, you know, we did um, we did try to get um, get data across a wide spectrum of companies of different sizes when we when we do our surveys, and um, I I don't recall a significant difference in the responses. Um, I, I don't have that data right here at hand, so I can't answer this mm. perfectly well. But as my recollection, mm. uh, I mean, I, I I take the point. You know, smaller companies have fewer funds to work with. Uh, I get that. But hmm. um, but you know the, they have the same challenges and they uh, they yeah. have to find some way to do it. So um, I they are yeah. by and large many many of them are so. Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. If I remember correctly, we did come out with a report uh, on on digital transformation in, in smaller companies uh, a couple of years ago, if I recall. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I think um, it's a I think it's definitely happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question which uh, we we have uh, we tend to see at uh, at our events over here is about uh, return on investment. Uh, and the question person is asking, uh, uh, what kind of ROI are companies getting uh, from their investments in digital transformation? Again, not not such an easy question question to answer a single question a single single answer <laughs> to that question. Uh, it's an interesting question, and. Um... Mm. I don't. I don't really have any data. I don't think we got any collected any data in any of our recent surveys, and I don't have any anecdotal data about um, the level of ROI that companies are getting. But we usually hear the ROI question in terms of justifying a digital transformation project, um, mm. and um, you know, so there was. Um, there was a time, um, and probably we're still largely in this time where that justification, you know, uh, that justification wasn't that hard to do, um, and maybe didn't even really need to be done um, formally in some cases because, you know, the project that you're undertaking was uh, initiated by your CEO or something, um, so you know mm. you're just going to do it. Um, so we've seen a little bit less of that. Um, and a little bit more of uh, of justification uh, requirements, but uh, it's not at the level that we used to see it. Uh, and and I think the reason why is um, uh, many of the projects that were undertaken in the past, especially from the OT side, uh, were um, were projects that were um, you know would make make things a little more productive in the manufacturing plant and um, or the industrial plant. And, um, you know, sometimes that would work, but many times it would be like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to pay more money to make you guys, uh, you know, 2% more productive. Just become 2% more productive on your own. Uh, so we'd see that kind of thing. So the ROI um, justification played a big role when you're just talking about incremental improvements. But when you're talking about significant transformations, mm -hmm. you know, there's often a, a you know, a, a, you know, a, a bigger reason, a strategic reason, you know, to uh, outpace your competitors or mm -hmm. provide your customers with something that, that they haven't been able to get elsewhere or, Mm. Or something like that. That's um, it's a little mm. harder to quantify. So the ROI question kind of falls away. Okay. Okay. Um, another <clears throat> another question we have uh, from the audience, which is about companies. They they know the benefits of digital transformation, or by by now at least uh, they they should do. But uh, but what why is why is progress not being made. I mean, I guess this person asked about the roadblocks, which which I, I know you covered some of those in, in your presentation. But um, again, again, I think the question is saying, you know, there are clear and obvious benefits, but still this reluctance. Could, could you shed any more light on that, Greg? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure quite understand the, the question there, Bob. Um, 
Well, he's saying, you know, why why are we making more progress than we are, given that, that the benefits are, are pretty well known in terms of the benefits we can get from digital transformation. Um, so um, the roadblocks that uh, companies are up against. I mean, what 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 kind of uh, what what are the impediments to 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 embarking on the road embarking on digital transformation that, that, that well, do you see are yeah. most important? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the um, it, it's just the sheer magnitude of the pro of the problem is mm -hmm. the, is the issue. Uh, you know, we touched on it. And I tried to touch on it in my presentation, yeah. but it touches so many different areas within the organization. Yeah. And often, uh, you know, it's cross departmental, and um, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of mm. people issues and change management yeah. issues that that occur in, in a situation like yeah. that, and those can slow things mm. down. And yeah. um, you know, some of the recommendations I had at the end of my presentation about the things you need to do. Um, are really designed to address yeah. those kind of traps because we do mm. see, I mean, we have seen the companies, you know, start down and then, I mean, in some cases they, uh, you know, the programs get canceled. They need to get restarted again in a, in a, it's a year or two, but they, you know, in, in, um, in a lot of public companies, you know, they're driven quarter to quarter and, uh, yeah. you know, things can happen. And these systems, these, mm -hmm. these things aren't, um, you know, they're important and critically important, but not easy. Yeah. So that's yeah, kind, of, I think, kind of where the world Yeah, is. I mean, so, so I, I always tend to say when I engage at uh, events that transformation is, is a big word and uh, engaging in transformation is, a, is, is not a trivial activity. <laughs> yes, uh, I think that's not. something <laughs> that, uh, so... Digitalizing something, a few, putting a few cents on, on a production line is one thing, but if you want to transform the organization using digital technology, that's a much larger endeavor. And I think that's also uh, what you alluded to in terms of uh, this being a, you know, not, not an easy thing to do. And that right. is leading to some hesitation. Uh, this, this question is uh, a bit more on the technology side. Um, a long question from Tian Julian, but I'll try, try and uh, paraphrase it as best I can. Uh, it's really asking about there's a lot of vendors providing uh, digital solutions for 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 digital transformation in, in manufacturing uh, but uh, what about if the companies themselves want to develop their own solutions in-house uh, how, how can you how can you optimize the the external solutions that are available from suppliers to suit to uh, to internal um, developments? Uh, by the companies themselves mm. that's the question well let me see if i uh um well i mean so we this so the question suggests the whole notion of uh of composable apps that i was uh referring to mm. um and the um and with this kind of an approach this kind of a software approach um it becomes more practical to, you know, to kind of uh, roll your own. So this is a bit of an extreme example, maybe, but because um, instead of say a, a, an MES system, which today they're they're pretty well built out and they're pretty broadly functional and they can do a lot of things and they fit a lot of different industries, but that's a big chunk of code uh, that they've built there. And so that means that uh, you could use it but you may not be able to get them to add a feature that you like. Um, mm. So um, you could, um, you could, um, you know, just build some, um, some small apps, you know, using microservices, uh, an app for, you know, scanning or tracking or an app for reporting or, you know, various little apps like that. And you could just build your own collection of the things that you think you need and, and they're relatively easy to support. Uh, you know, at one point we would just never recommend, uh, you know, rolling your own software. Um, it's kind of possible now uh, if companies want to embark on that. But what we see more often, to be honest, is... Uh, is companies will have uh, you know some core software that'll do most of everything they want, and then on the same platform, uh, they'll just build a little um, uh, side app 
to to cover the gap that they've identified and they can do it on their own and don't have to worry about the vendors and, and things things work out pretty well that way in fact, fact another, we do have benefit, a question. another yeah, benefit sorry, sorry my um mm. well i'm thinking about that so i used mes as an example but if you build a bunch of those um those core pieces uh, that you know taken together provide the functionality that you need you may also find that you you know, may add another module or two, and then you've got a maintenance app as well. So you don't need to duplicate, uh, you know, have another reporting app or another um, scanning app or, or data collection app or, or something like that. You know, you can just reuse the ones you've already built in many cases and add, add some more functionality. So you can grow the, the portfolio of things that you address uh, uh, pretty easily. Which is why, you know, if you remember, think back to my big bang slide and you've got a lot of new products mm -hmm. to support and data coming from them and going to them and uh, all kinds of things that need to happen there. Um, if you've got a platform like that that you can work on, it's it's really quite powerful. In fact, in fact there is a question about composable apps uh, and the person is asking, uh, who who is driving uh, who is driving adoption? Is it be, is it being driven by IT or or, or OT? Who or uh, what? Who's who's driving uh, this uh, this big, big next big bang? Yeah, um, well, uh, um, yeah, well, it's kind of happening everywhere right now. It, I think it's probably one of the I um, like the cloud and the and the software as a service model and and some other things. Uh, it probably started with IT, uh, but mm. we are seeing uh, we're seeing a, a lot of the uh, traditional OT vendors, uh, big players especially, and and a few small uh, startups are uh, are just building these things uh, as fast as they can. And it's, so in those cases. <clears throat> If you think about it, that means um, that they're going to have to, they're going to have a, um, a replacement in many cases for their existing um, product suite, you know, uh, of monolithic apps. So and that's the direction they see as the future. Uh, like I said, it's um, kind of one of those um, ITOT things where a lot of these things started in IT and eventually made their way down uh, into the plant, and this is probably one of them too. Mm -mm. Um, AI. There's a couple of questions on on AI. I'll, I'll take one. Are, are there are there specific examples of AI applications that have led to sustainability improvements in manufacturing? I, I I'm, I'm sure there are some examples out there. AI is a tricky one. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know because. Um... You can use AI in a in a variety of ways uh, to improve sustainability, um, you know, by energy management and and things like that. Um, but you can also um, um, you can also use AI for uh, um, uh, you know for reporting uh, and gathering the data and reporting it. Uh, so, so that's good too. But your investors also uh, and stake other stakeholders can use AI to test you and see how real it is. So, uh, it's kind of on both sides of the coin there. So, you kind of better be doing it enough so that the investors uh, remain happy. So, there's that. But well, the mm, other part mm. of the problem is um, uh, AI's dirty little secret is that uh, the hardware it runs on is often uh, very energy intensive. So if it drives a lot of a lot of uh, carbon mm -hmm. usage, so you need it, uh, but you have to find a balance there. Mm -hmm. So, as, as you know, AI has been around for about sixty years or so. But do do you believe that right now? I, I know it was the most impactful technology in 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 our ARC survey. Uh, but do you believe do you believe that now this is for real? We won't see another AI winter. This is uh, uh, going to make make, uh, make a big impact. <laughs> uh, actually, I do think that's one of the um, that, that's one of the reasons it's such a hot topic right now. Well, of course, yeah. Chat GPT it got everybody talking about AI again, so there is that. But um, mm -hmm. but no, I do think um, 
I, I like the concept you mentioned of AI winter, but I do think that right now the the whole industry is, is realizing that the the AI tools and systems uh, have evolved. Uh, the underlying hardware and infrastructure has evolved. Um, and all this taken together, uh, I think, has reached a tipping point where this is a real potential game changer. So I don't think it's a, I don't think it's just a, a backroom science project anymore. Okay, that's that's oh, that's, that's good to hear. Um, uh, with that, uh, I I <clears throat> I'll bring my 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 segment to a close. And I thank the audience for for the questions. So I apologize if we didn't get through to. To everybody, given the time, uh, but right now, let me hand back to my ARC colleague for the closing section. Thank you, Bob. Hello, everyone. Uh, just a quick update on the upcoming event. We have our next DTC, the Best Practices Webinar, is scheduled for 18th October 2023. We have forums coming up next year, uh, starting from our US forum, which is on uh, February 5th to 8th, Orlando, Florida. Euro Forum dates will be announced soon. Asia Forum, uh, Japan event is on 4 July 2024. Bangalore event is on 10 and 11 July 2024. And for the first time, we'll be having a Singapore event, which is on 30 and 31 July 2024. As we are concluding, I would like to thank Greg Kovac, Vice President, Digitization and IoT, ARC Advisory Group for participating in this DTC Asia webinar. I would also like to thank Popil, General Manager, ARC Advisory Group, for moderating the webinar. Uh, we also like to thank all the delegates for participating in the webinar. Finally, we thank ARC Advisory Group India team for all the logistic support. Thank you all once again. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.